Welcome to Accountable, where your business is our business. Hosted by David R. Peters. Welcome to Accountable, the podcast for CFOs by a CFO. Hey, my name's Dave. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for this episode. So one of the things that uh, I think no matter what uh, sort of place you have in the financial services industry, one of the things that I think we have all been kind of intrigued by in the last few years is just this rise and uh, the uh, all the attention that is happening as a result of virtual currency. I think that if you are a CFO, you are a controller, you are maybe a financial advisor, you're a tax accountant, I'm not really sure that we have seen a topic that uh, has gotten such interest as virtual currency just kind of across the board. And if you're like me, I think that uh, at least a part of you has to wonder how exactly all of this happened. Where did uh, this all start? How exactly did we get to where we are and where exactly are we going? And so I think if you're like me and you're wondering those things, then we have a great guest uh, for you here today. So my guest this uh, this episode of Accountable is Jerry Camizio, who is the Associate Director Director of the Business Law Program at Washington College of Law. And uh, Jerry is, uh, is, has a very interesting background. His background is, uh, is in banking, and he teaches courses on U.S. and international banking law. And one of his, uh, his topics that he teaches and speaks on all the time is uh, the virtual currency law that is out there. And uh, I the, the thing that I love about Jerry is, is that he does a great job of explaining in very lu- a very lucid way of how exactly we got to where we are. Uh, you know, virtual currency, I think to a lot of us, it just feels very different. I think uh, for a lot of people, uh, it just uh, feels like something that uh, is almost not real. It, I, I think it almost feels like monopoly money a good bit of the time to uh, a lot of us that are in financial services. And so, uh, but yet at the same time, our clients are asking us questions about it. Our clients are investing in it. And I think a lot, there's just a lot of interest in it. And so I think uh, we as financial services professionals, we want to be able to say something about it to clients, to our colleagues, and to the people that are asking us about it. I mean, uh, you know, we are supposed to be the ones that uh, uh, that uh, people come to to get advice and to get guidance about uh, financial related issues, and so we want to feel better about uh, this idea of virtual currency. So today, we're going to spend some time talking with Jerry about uh, all of the things uh, related to virtual currency. Uh, We're going to focus primarily on the regulatory aspects and really just uh, what do we tell clients and uh, how in the world did we get here? So uh, this is going to be a great interview. I'm very excited to bring it to you. Enjoy my interview with Jerry Camizio. Jerry, thank you so much for being on Accountable. Hey, Dave, it's so good to be here. Well, I so I have to tell you, you and I, we met at uh, SCAPA's uh, Fall Fest conference, and uh, your background is just fascinating to me because I have to tell you that, uh, especially these days, this idea of virtual currency, uh, this whole concept of uh, a virtual currency and kind of everything that goes along with it, I think for a lot of us practitioners, it almost feels like monopoly money. You know, I mean, it almost feels like something that... That uh, you know is out of like a board game, and it just like isn't quite real. And so um, I, I am fascinated by the fact that you have gotten into uh, this, and uh, uh, you uh, 
are are someone who is, uh, you know, really involved, uh, you know, in kind of uh, just kind of the uh, regulatory aspects of this and uh, just uh, kind of everything that's going on. Um, I would love to just hear kind of how you got uh, involved uh, uh, in this uh, in this uh, uh, kind of newer uh, uh, type of currency that's out there. And just uh, can you just tell us a little bit more about what this is? Because I think a lot of us as practitioners, I think we're still trying to figure it out. Yeah, sure thing, Dave. And, and, and by the way, it w- was great to be at the uh, SCAP of Fall Fest. Yeah. Um, it, you know, I've, I've spoken, you know, I speak to all kinds of groups and peoples and, and, and pe- people and groups. And so it was kind of interesting. Uh, I had a sense of, oh, no, before I just before I got on the stage, realizing these are all accountants. What, what are, <laughs> you know, how do I, you know, how do I pitch my presentation? And yeah. the most important thing I could think of was after a lifetime in private practice and the government working with accountants all of every day of the week, um, I, I realized that my best move was to come up with a few lawyers jokes, which was kind of where I ended up, uh, yeah. starting the presentation. And I, and I got some respectable elapse and I made it clear that both uh, the two, uh, the two jokes I told were told to me by accountants. So over the, there years, you go, there you go. Lawyers. Um, well, you know, Dave, you're asking probably the number one question because I think, you know, everybody from, professionals advising clients like accountants, uh, lawyers, investment bankers, financial advisors, to um, just consumers of financial products and services are very interested in, in what this crypto issue is all about. And, and y- y- you know, the, uh, of, you know, it goes by many, many names. And that's right. kind of the interesting part. You can call it crypto, you can call it virtual currency, you know, the some of the techies call it digital assets, and we'll talk yep. about that. That may end up being one of the more accurate uh, names for the for the technology involved. And you know, ever since the first virtual currency, Bitcoin, in two thousand and eight, this has been an, an ongoing discussion. Even as virtual currency has made it from the obscure uh, crypto blogs to the business section of the newspaper and the business channels. Now with recent events, uh, you know, not all of them good, certainly from the crypto industry, trading industry perspective, it's gotten to what, what some newspapers refer to as the A section, uh, right. which we, a combination of policy law enforcement issues and consumer financial protection issues. So it's really raised the profile Um, But, you know, the basic question, you know, what is what are digital assets? What is virtual currency? You know, on one level, you know, it it can be technically complex, but I I think, you know, boiling it down to its essentials. um, Anybody knows what a digital asset is because they experience in other contexts, you know, things that are stored digitally, videos, photos, documents. Uh, and it, it's a similar concept, only um, it's a digital asset that's issued and transmitted through what are known as decentralized networks. And decentralized is, is a crypto industry early on term that they used to describe not the government. And not only and, and you kind of get the feel for where crypto comes from in its infancy, not the government, not traditional financial institutions. Mm-hmm. And, and that those are actually both important concepts in, in, in the birth of crypto. Uh, and it's designed to create, transmit, and determine the value of, say, the first one, uh, Bitcoin. Uh, it's also, you know, and, and you know, you see all these technical terms and 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 they uh, they frighten most people, including me, when you first see them. But <laughs> it's also, you know, it's it's what they call open source. The so-called Bitcoin ledger. Uh, is is basically a public transactional ledger on which, and let's talk about Bitcoin for since it's the first. It's on which all the trans. It's it's the ledger upon which all transaction is recorded, uh, commonly referred to as the blockchain. Right. Uh, and, and the blockchain is a public record of every transaction. For example, with Bitcoin. Including with Bitcoin, it, it was the initial question of creating Bitcoin. And it's it, Bitcoin is somewhat 
uh, unique is the first and, and most traded um, virtual currency. Ba basically, the, the concept was that ultimately there was only going to be a set inventory. About 21 million Bitcoin would exist. So part of the strategy was to have a limited number, although 21 million is a big number, um, and to originate them over the course of time, you're going to have this kind of mining concept where people originally could sit at their computers and essentially mine Bitcoin by solving basic algorithms, uh, mathematical algorithms. And what that did for the blockchain was the miners, as they created Bitcoin, extended the blockchain added to the beginnings of the credibility of the blockchain on which all following transactions follow. Now, the interesting thing is mining has gone from an interesting little hobby where people originated a lot of Bitcoin in the early days. Um, but the catch is as more Bitcoin is mined over the years, it be the algorithms become increasingly complex. Right. And so today, you and I can't mine Bitcoin. You, you would need a whole farm, as they call them, of uh, supercomputers churning out uh, algorithms to try to solve it. it. It's actually interesting. There was a University of Chicago article th th about two years ago that said, oh, wow, uh, Bitcoin mining is turning out to be one of the most unanticipated causes of climate change in energy use. And, sure. and okay. so it has now become part of, I mean, some countries have literally, in, in, in Europe, for example, countries have literally... Um, Pass laws saying Bitcoin can only be mined now through uses of alternate energy sources. It's become a big subject with things like the uh, the Paris Climate Change Protocols uh, to, to to kind of deal with this issue. So it's been an interesting side uh, issue that's that's kind of um, certainly you know, not certainly not something that we would anticipate, right? I mean, you know, that just uh, it doesn't. I don't think that that's the first thing that comes to mind. No, and Dave, look, there's a lot of things that weren't anticipated. About <laughs> that's definitely that's definitely one of them. And you know, you know, if you ever hear the phrase "the law of unintended consequences," well, you know, yeah. who, who knew right. climate change was going to be uh, implicated? And then, and then, basically, the bottom line within the set, you know, with a basic, the basic Bitcoin, uh, which I'm kind of focused on only because it's the largest. Sure. traded uh, in largest volume trading um the value and this is what gets people like what what why does bitcoin have that well it's basically it, it's a vector of the supply of bitcoin versus the demand of bitcoin and how much people want it or don't want it and, right. and so you know uh bitcoin the uh, kind of like the stock market over the over the last 30 years you know it goes up and it's gone down and, right. and, you know, we'll talk more about how it's it's gone down dr dramatically over the last um, six months or so because of, of uh, a number of, of current uh, uh, developments. And then, you know, th there are more recent generation of um, crypto that have may have value in tokens and coins. And we can we can chat a little bit more about that. For example, certain types of crypto have more than inherent value uh, when you purchase it from an entity or a corporation that then uses that money like any uh, startup company um, to engage in business um, enterprises. There, there's the possibility that your token or coin will appreciate in the aftermarket based on the perceived value of the company's activities and revenues and, and, and that kind of thing. So. Um, but, you know, the early days of Bitcoin, uh, not too long ago in the history of the universe, I mean, it was 2008, that a very kind of mysterious ca character by the name of Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, and, and there has been massive debate about who or what Satoshi Nakamoto is or was, uh, a lot of thoughts that if that's not the real name. There is a guy named Satoshi Nakamoto in Japan who's an engineer. Uh, who said, who has repeatedly said, I am not that guy. I am not him. Uh, he, yeah. he's Conti at a, his computers have broken down multiple times from just the explosion of email traffic and inquiries he gets. Uh, but, you know, it's been attributed to everything from a, uh, uh, a group 
to some folks have even said it's some kind of it was some kind of a hybrid artificial intelligence production. So it is conspiracy theories that left and right. So it's an interesting beginning for what has turned out to be, um, you, you know, at different times over the last year, uh, cryptos in total have 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 been uh, had up to a three trillion dollar global market cap. Um, right. Now that number's certainly gone up and down over the last year, but um, not going away is, is right. probably the best way I would characterize it. And you know, then you get into the questions of of, of uh, what do we do with it? What what is it good for? You know, how do we regulate it and whatnot? Yeah, no, and and I think that this uh, that that's kind of the interesting thing about this is that for I think a lot of us it doesn't almost feel real because it's like we don't even really know completely kind of where this you know where this started and so I think that that uh, in itself is kind of interesting. Um, how did you get started, uh, kind of in all of this? I mean, uh, you know, because I, I think it's uh, it's interesting to hear, um, you know, because th there's just not a whole lot of knowledge out there, I would say, um, about digital assets, about virtual currency. How did you kind of come in contact with this uh, in in your professional life? It's a good question, Dave. Uh, it, for me, it wasn't it, it wasn't some esoteric exploration of, of, of an <laughs> off the track issue. It was more as a private sector lawyer at Fleet Frank, and before that, yeah. was Paul Hastings. After leaving the uh, Treasury Department years ago um, as, as a banking regulator, as a financial services lawyer, uh, necessity became the mother of invention because. It all for banking lawyers, financial services lawyers who, you know, and I had worked previously with a lot of financial services companies that, that I would say had what I would call a house of financial services, um, uh, you, you know, banking, uh, securities, brokerage, uh, investment advisory, investment fund, insurance, annuity, you know, broad ranges of activities, a lot of parent companies that originally specialized in one of those. And then over the years through mergers and acquisitions, some of them in the, during the financial crisis became these big houses of financial services. And what first attracted their intention as a banking lawyer working with them at a lot of the New York based companies was, uh, was Bitcoin. Right. Because what caught some attention early on was the title of uh, Satoshi Nakamoto's paper. It was a white paper, which became, you know, and white paper has become a kind of generic term for kind of an exploration of a new topic kind of thing or a new business. And the white paper was entitled Bitcoin, a peer to peer transaction system. Mm -hmm. And once folks started to pick up and, and financial services, the what I call the traditional financial services industry, they started to pick up and take a glance at this as Bitcoin starts, you know, getting into the, the financial press every now and then. They, and, and they first said, hmm, interesting payment transmission. And they understand payment transmission. They, they do enough of it, as does the Federal Reserve. Sure. You know, Federal Reserve processes 60 percent of all uh, payments in the U.S. That's trillions of dollars of transactions. And they thought that was interesting. And then they read through the next couple of paragraphs in the summary of this white paper. And they said, whoa, wait a minute. Peer to peer specifically means cutting all financial institutions, credit card companies, yeah. banks, merch, the, the processing banks when you do a consumer transaction. The idea is to cut all of these parties out of the fees. Right. So so they woke up one morning and, and it was like, uh, you know, if you ever watch Seinfeld, there, there, there was the episode with the soup Nazi who yes. sometimes to some customers say no soup for you. Right. Well, they they the financial institution started to say no fees for me. Right. And that was big. And, and here's why, Dave, you know, because representing financial institutions over the last 30 plus years, their model the banks especially has changed. 35 years ago, banks made almost 100% of their income from loan interest. Uh, they okay. take, take in deposits, make loans. The difference between that minus expenses 
what you lend it out for versus what you bring it in for as deposits is, is your profit. They used to refer to it as the 363 rule, uh, which some people thought was, hey, you, you bring the deposit in at 3%, you lend it out at 6 and the difference is your profit. No, uh, it meant banking was a very simple uh, business at that time, 35, 40 years ago. You, you would bring it in at 3% in deposits, lend it out at 6%, and three the other three was the time you'd be out on the golf course because right. <laughs> banking, is a very, banking is a very simple business. So, but over the last 30, 35 years, it's important in this whole crypto discussion to know that banks now make uh, more than 50% of their income comes from fees. Right. And if you don't believe me, next time you go to an ATM machine out of your bank's network and pay the $3, you'll, you'll, know, you'll know what I'm talking about. And so these fees on transaction accounts of all types uh, on credit cards, uh, debit cards, you know, all kinds of uh, checking accounts, et cetera, et cetera. This is a major part of their business. And it started to occur to some of the financial companies that, wow, what is the implication of this? And it was then proceeded by, I'm really busy. I hope this just goes away. Right. And, and then it proceeded not to go away. And then it became... And, and, you know, when you ask me, like, gee, how, how did I get it? With the traditional financial services companies, my experience was that crypto became uh, their processing of crypto became like the five stages of grief when someone <laughs> goes past the way. Right. The first was just denial. And denial took the form of this stuff's fraud. This is not going to catch on. This is fraud. Um, and, and then you see they start to slowly change as, as the market cap gets bigger. The um, price of Bitcoin was the major one in, in, early on, starts increasing. People are investing in it. Um, they, and, and then they get hit with like some really important demographic issues where up to 40, there's been studies this past year, 40% of millennials between the ages of 18 and 29 have invested or are invested in crypto. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and that, and in, in a real sense, it started to occur that, you know, in, in terms of the overall statistics, which is almost 20% of all Americans invest in crypto. Um, you know, the millennial one, which is a sought after dem demographic for banks especially you want to get your business when you're younger and keep it as you get older and have more assets. Um, it, you know, it started, it started to occur to them, wow, this is almost like the millennial stock market. Yeah. Um, uh, and they're just in, in you know, so the, the second stage was more like we need, to, they stopped saying it, it. Most of them stopped saying it's fraud. They started to say behind the scenes to like their counsel and advisors, uh, could you write us a memo? Tell us a little bit more about this. How does sure. this all work? And then next thing you know, um, they uh, they were starting to make small toehold acquisitions in all kinds of financial technologies. You know, it goes in shorthand as fintech these days. And today, you know, before the kind of adverse events in the crypto trading industry and, and in this past year, this past summer, um, you, you know, they, there's many articles in the financial press about major companies um, starting to engage in crypto related activities, you know, custody accounts, trust accounts, um, uh, you, you know, basically there was an article two days ago in Wall Street Journal, Goldman Sachs is looking for a good bargain to buy a crypto trading exchange. Um, and, you know, the J.P. Morgan in particular, I, I was always struck by J.P. Morgan a year or two after their president had been publicly quoted that crypto is fraud. A couple of things happened uh, by 2018. Their annual report in the management discussion and analysis, which is kind of talking about where you see things going on some levels, said that uh, we, we stand to lose substantial revenues in future years to digital assets. Uh, and it's like, hey, they 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 get it. Right. They're going to lose the income. Right. And next thing you know, uh, J.P. Morgan, and I'm, I'm not picking on J.P. Morgan. I'm, I'm just looking at the stream of events that are kind of not not 
atypical uh, in terms of engagement by the traditional financial services industry. They started, they began issuing a JPM coin. Okay. Um, and just a few months ago, JP Morgan, beginning in the summer, they, they, um, they announced that they were uh, appointing their first crypto policy officer. Um, and so it's been an interesting transition for me. That's how it started with what, with what I call the traditional financial services industry. That's the big banks. The small banks started to ask questions because of just, you know, small community banks, smaller community banks, and that's most of the industry numerically, banking-wise. I mean, there may be 4,900 banks in the U.S. The top 10 have about 60 or 70 percent of the total assets. The top 15 probably have more than 80 percent. And then you have about 4,500 community banks of various sizes. They just started to ask questions because the senior officers at the community banks, they see customers every day. And they started to raise the issue, gee, you know, I really can't afford to say anymore that I don't know anything about it. Right. Because I feel like I risk losing business and I have to start thinking about what can I do to, to engage customers and, and, and maybe take advantage of fee income. So that was one place that crypto started hitting my, my banking practice. And then the other side was the, the new crypto industry, the emerging crypto trading industry. And what attracted attention and, and got me involved with that part of the world was basically New York State. I, as a banking lawyer, I practiced in front of the New York Department of Financial Services for many years. I knew them ways back when, when I was, when I was a, a regulator. Um, and um, they came up with a special charter in 2015 that uh, they called the Special Purpose uh, Trust Company Charter that was intended to be a crypto trading exchange charter that had an interesting aspect to it. It would be highly regulated as mm -hmm. a bank, literally examined, uh, audited, and regulated like banks. And you know, New York Department of Financial Services, in my experience, they're a tough regulator. Probably maybe For one sure. of the in the United States. Uh, and money laundering, they, they've taken some of the biggest cases against international banks that any country or regulator has taken. So the, the strategy there was offering a highly regulated charter to uh, folks who want to engage in the crypto trading businesses. And, and so uh, folks like the Winklevoss brothers of social network fame uh, ended up starting a crypto trading exchange under New York law. Some say they... Um, where some say that they, they were a proponent of right. New York going this route because a lot of the issues in 2014, 2015 were all the uh, potential concerns and abuses with crypto trading exchange in terms of hacks of accounts, fraud, theft, the whole bit. Um, and a couple of big problems like Mount Gox was a big failure of the Japanese trading crypto trading exchange. Uh, and cons just basic concerns were concerns every everybody who wants to execute any kind of trade. Um, the gap between the bid and ask price. Um, yeah. yeah. You could go to the at that time you go to the Moldova exchange, which operated in what I would call a regulatory light jurisdiction, and you know there'd be substantial um, distance between bid and ask price. And right. so the highly regulated charter was designed to to address that in New York, and. So my entree to that was like, um, you know, the, these new these new crypto industry exchanges, once they went there for the charter, they would say, hey, by the way, uh, you, 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 we just realized we're going to be regulated by a formidable state banking regulator here in New York. Yeah. The, um, who should we get like as an attorney who knows how to represent somebody <laughs> in front of a financial institution? And so uh, as, as one client said to me, the uh, the New York folks seem to know you, and, and yeah. you should get somebody you should get somebody like a Jerry Camizio. And so, a couple of clients said we decided we would just get Jerry Camizio instead of somebody like Jerry. There you and go. So, you, you know, and that that comes from many years in, in the government and, and building up relations with, with fellow regulators. And so, I was happy for the the, the referrals. But so I got I got to see 
from two different angles. How traditional financial services was looking at these issues and how are they addressing uh, it as a business matter and a competitive matter. And also the new and emerging crypto trading exchanges and how they were dealing with, in New York in particular, a, a, uh, a more highly regulated um, uh, kind of exchange uh, regulation for crypto trading than had existed previously. So that that was my uh, that was my entree. And then you know, one morning, I happened to look in back of me on on a shelf in back of my desk where I still tended to keep some things in paper form, so I don't constantly destroy trees. Everything I want, anytime I want to print something out, I, I I was like there was wow there was like eleven binders of different areas of law that involved. Uh, crypt, crypto being regulated, uh, and uh, so that that actually at some point became the basis uh, of a book I, I've written on uh, called "Virtual Currency Law: The Emerging Legal and Regulatory Framework," because that just seemed to be an organic issue that started to come up, mostly because crypto is, um, you know, what's what's the word? My my, uh, my fifth grade. Teacher used to talk about students using what, what she used to call a nickel word. Well, ubiquitous is a nickel word. <laughs> Crypto is ubiquitous. It has many different facets and to many different regulators and regulatory schemes, depending on the particular product being offered, it may be subject to different areas of regulation. So it's very unique that you, you have crypto being regulated by uh, under the securities laws, under yeah. the commodities laws, under the mutual yeah. fund laws, under the commercial laws, under the banking laws, under the tax laws, under the consumer financial laws. And that's just the beginning. Uh, yeah. Every day of the week, there's a new question given what the features are right. of, of the product. And I think down at... Um, the down in Columbia at the conference, uh, uh, SCAFA conference, I had mentioned, I, I said, look, you know, I don't want to get too abstract here, but kind of reminds me of there's an old Hindu folk tale about the blind men and the elephant. And, you know, there's a bunch of blind men surround the elephant and someone says, what is a, What does an elephant look like? And depending on where the blind men touched, they had different ideas of what the elephant looked like. Well, that's kind of like state and federal regulators. Yeah. Um, who began to see products, crypto products, and said, so, wait a minute, that, you know, FinCEN at the Treasury Department, for example, early on said, hey, that's money transmission. You buy and sell crypto you need, as a business matter, you need, you, need a, um, you, you need a money transmission license. Yeah. And same thing came on, on under, you know, so you kind of have this emerging legal and regulatory framework that had no organ. I mean, it's like crypto itself, no centralized organization of regulators. It's basically each state and federal, I mean, there's 51 state regulators uh, in all aspects of financial services and, and other laws, corporate laws. There's numerous federal financial regulatory and law enforcement and, uh, you, know, you know, agencies charged with things like money laundering, sanctions and embargoes. And so the, the, they became, I guess, I, what I for want of, literally for want of a better word, I guess I just started to be like this organic growth yeah. of legal, like a legal and regulatory framework started to take shape. Yeah, no, for sure. And, and so I, th I, I think you hit on a lot of really interesting things here is just, I mean, just the immense amount of growth that we've seen from a legal and regulatory perspective. A lot of this, though, I mean, I got to tell you, Jerry, it sounds to me like a lot of this, though, really stems from the fact that people are actually investing in uh, in virtual assets. Right. I mean, in digital assets, if they wouldn't be investing in it, if they wouldn't be putting money in it, uh, if there wasn't sort of an interest there, uh, then you probably wouldn't see, you know, kind of this this proliferation that we've seen. Um, and I think that that's the part that I think, at least on the practitioner side, I think kind of boggles my mind and probably boggles a lot of the practitioners' minds, too. Their clients are getting involved in this stuff. And uh, yet they really, I, I think in a lot of cases, I think, you, you know, you pointed out the uh, number of people, younger people, people in their 20s that are getting involved uh, in digital assets. And 
um, I can't imagine that, uh, you know, that they maybe have the understanding to maybe understand the complexity of some of the products that they're buying. Uh, would you agree with that or, or am I, am I off base in, in my thinking? No, I, I, I agree. And I, I think it's been interesting to say, take the millennial investors, yeah. who, you know, maybe this is the first time they've invested money in, 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 um, to make a an investment, and you know, look, they they they've learned an important lesson that anybody who purchases stock uh, probably found out after you know 1995 to 2007. You have one of the most roaring up economies in U.S. history, and the financial crisis hits. I, I think they've learned an important lesson about crypto, as in any other investment type market. What goes up can come down. Right. Uh, Right. It doesn't necessarily go up forever. I, you know, let's be, you know, part of the reputation of crypto is like this alt currency certainly had some traction. And also, you know, for a, a period of time starting 2014, 2015, up until this year, just the continued upward trend as, as yeah. investment, as a hey, look in every frothy market, stock market, I mean, you know, there's there's speculation, you know, when when, you know, what's speculation? It's the process whereby you invest in things you that you have no idea what it is. Right. Uh, True. You know, and and so, it, you know, it happened in the e market. Yeah. In the late 90s. Any company that had the word e before. Yeah. Let's buy that. I'm into e. e. True. Uh, early 80s. Uh, when I was at the SEC, it was the medical um, uh, instrument and product. Anything that had the word bio in front of it would sell like hotcakes and not always necessarily understanding what it is your investment is all about. And and that certainly concerns policymakers because what what the trend has been, and it's been interesting that the U.S. in particular this past year, the federal government and the and, and my administration is the the current administration has certainly started to weigh in on the crypto issue. Yes. And what's interesting is the Ukraine invasion, really uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, really pushed up on the agenda crypto from like oh, it's like a regulatory issue how we're going to deal with it to like a national security issue. Yeah. Because all of a sudden, the, the, in the wake of the Ukraine invasion, as you know. The U.S. starts imposing sanctions and embargoes on Russia and, and people in Russia and groups. And um, then the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, major financial press starts printing articles that say things like, hey, is Russia using crypto to get around the U.S. sanctions? Correct. Now, yep. you want to get attention of U.S. policymakers who deal with sanctions and embargoes? Just say something like that, that yeah. you can get around them. The, the U.S. Uh, policymakers uh, seem to believe that sanctions are pretty formidable uh, as the largest economy in the world, the U.S. And so this started to attract attention. So the Biden administration came out with its first policy, major policy statement on digital assets in March and said a couple of interesting things. Um, on one hand, similar to most of the West, as that term is used in uh, market economies, they said, look, um, the U.S. is a, a leader in yeah. financial services, global leader, and we want to keep that going in financial technologies. So it wasn't uh, uh, it wasn't a opening salvo that says, we hate crypto, let's get rid of it. Right. Uh, but by the same token, the, the, the marker was put out as on policy issues that, hey, but... And there's always, you know, you're, you know, this is a but situation, but it raises national security issues. Yep. Um, it raises financial stability issues. And that that's a term, by the way, Dave, that is just fraught with meaning because that was the big phrase that came out of the, uh, the financial crisis of 2008 in the Dodd-Frank Act, uh, kind of the landmark reform legislation. What do we need to do in regulating banks to uh, maintain U.S. and global financial stability? So that was a big term to be used. And then it it says, look, and we got other concerns that have been concerns about crypto from the get go. Money laundering, hacking, 
uh, ransomware, the idea of paying ransomware in crypto, uh, holding customer accounts hostage to basically crypto ransom. And, and there was a whole laundry list and, and tax concerns, evading the tax yes, laws. Right. And, and so basically, you know, they, they said, here's a this is a balance. And the question is, how do we do both? And at that time in March, they said, you know, there needs to be some discussion about, and this is a like kind of an inside the beltway term, a whole of government approach, which to me kind of meant, is there a need for a more centralized look-see at regulating crypto rather than just letting it like kind of organically happen? Does there right. need to be more of a policy focus on it? And that's that was the executive order coming into the beginning of May, which kind of, you know, even though it was the summertime, actually became known as crypto winter right? because of all of the problems that have started to arise in the crypto trading exchanges. And beginning with Coinbase, uh, one of the only exchanges to go public, in May, Coinbase sets the world on fire by the SEC asked them to disclose the consequences of them being bankrupt, if that were to ever happen. And Coinbase discloses, by the way, the SEC wants us to disclose if, if, if we were if we were ever to go bankrupt, the customer assets, your accounts customers, would be part of the bankruptcy estate. It's not shielded from the bankruptcy. That freaked a lot of people out. And that yeah. caused Coinbase's stock price to go down. And that was immediately followed by um, this whole problem with Terra Luna, a type of stable coin where, where you know, tech, it was a technical issue, but the algorithm, an algorithm problem called, caused the coin to crash. And next thing you know, the marketplace is roiling for cryptos. And, and, and over the summer, you've had, you had at least four or five bankruptcies that were purely driven by customers uh, either withdrawing their accounts, liquidity drying up for these companies. So, it, it, you know, the, 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 everything from, uh, uh, you know, Voyager Digital, Celsius, Three Arrows, there were like five bankruptcies. And, you, you know, this really started to cast a little bit of a, a pall on the yeah. crypto trading exchange industry. Um, and, you know, from the crypto trading exchanges industry's perspective, then Murphy's Law kicked in, uh, a very old legal concept. I always like to joke where sometimes you have a situation where everything that can go wrong goes Does. wrong. Right. And that was the introduction to the FTX bankruptcy, uh, which now with the failure and the arrest of the former president and founder is now the poster child for not only crypto exchange failures, but just m massive um, a massive breakdown in everything from corporate governance to internal controls. This was this was a this was a poster child for everything that should not be done in any corporation. Right. Um, and and also raised some uh, you know the the the, the financial press has raised some issue about their investors too. You know why would why would an equity fund that's putting in a billion or two billion dollars why wouldn't they be you know monitoring their investment, looking at the accounting controls. Looking at boards, um, management, l looking at uh, the question of corporate governance. How is the, uh, you know, these are, these are, you know, now these are questions that are usually sharper for public companies, publicly held companies, because they're subject to a lot of disclosure and SEC rules. Uh, this is also a company uh, headquartered outside the US in the Bahamas, right. which, which for me is very reminiscent of. Uh, this, once again, the situation in the banking industry 35 or 40 years ago, all, all you have to do, and this may be a generational reference, but all you have to do is watch old James Bond movies. Bad, illegal money and money laundering is always happening in places like the Cayman Islands, the Bahamas, Switzerland, what were considered like rogue banking havens at the time. And, you know, for FTX, they managed to headquarter themselves in kind of a, a, a low regulatory environment in the Bahamas kind of running between whatever the existing regulatory raindrops were in the United States. And, and that was an issue as well. 
it, it, you know, as well as many other factors which, which are going to come out. But definitely the poster child for let's regulate crypto trading exchanges at the federal level. And that, that's kind of what the, the big issue is going to be. Well, and it, and it seems, I mean, to your point, I mean, it seems to kind of defy logic, right? I mean, you, you know, why invest in a company when you're not checking out internal controls and and kind of those those pieces? It it uh, it um, there's a breakdown there, um, you know, and it does seem like at least on some level, um, at least to me, um, that uh, you know, it seems like uh, the companies that are, are investing in crypto maybe are just getting excited and uh, and and uh, you know, just not really sort of understanding the risks involved. Uh, is is that? I mean, is is that a fair assessment? So they're 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 worried about getting behind, and so they're kind of you know slipping through, uh, slipshotting uh, through you know kind of some of the uh, you know some of the uh, steps that they would normally take when they were looking at, you know, kind of other investing options. Yeah, absolutely, Dave. And, and look, it, you know, th- there are great similarities to other markets and other times in sure. stock. Yeah, you know, and, and you know, the financial. I mean, when they they did the uh, the the kind of uh, uh, post mortem on the financial crisis, the epic financial crisis in two thousand and eight. Uh, you know, part of the analysis was. Basically, when you cut through the jargon, over the course of a number of years of booming economy, people forgot that interest rates can actually go up and right. housing prices don't go up forever. Right. And right. Just little adjustments in the market uh, on housing prices and interest rates in late to, in 2007 caused the entire subprime market and then the entire economy and then the entire global economy to almost uh, go under. And, and so the premise that, it, you know, markets go up, markets go down, certainly true in the case of crypto. Uh, yeah. You know, I think the important lesson for crypto investors, uh, other than, uh, you know, you, as with any investment, you should understand what you're getting yourself into and don't put in uh any more money than you're willing to lose. Uh, sure, and, sure. and that's true of any investment. And second, just understanding that, uh, you know, like any other market, they go up, they go down, and you know, you don't sit there expecting that this is this unique investment that's going to constantly go up forever because it's proven that it doesn't. Yeah. Uh, and it's certainly been, uh, you know, similar to the financial crisis on some levels, they're important lessons, same as the SNL crisis, you know, notable failures in the industry, fr- frauds and abuses really just highlight yeah. uh, some of some of these principles that that may 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 or may not lead to the second generation or the second stage of crypto and crypto trading exchanges in the U.S. in, in wake in the wake of what's happened this past summer. I think that that's a, that's a interesting. I, I I think that for a lot of us practitioners, though, that you know, as we're talking with clients, I mean, I think uh, may, and maybe clients are are getting you know smarter um, because uh, you know they're hearing about situations. I mean, most recently FTX, but I mean, a, as you have you know pointed out, I mean, you know, there's been other instances of kind of uh, you know digital assets you know going bad. Um, how, how do you, I mean, how do we protect clients from some of these negative aspects of, you know, digital assets? So they're excited about this concept, about this idea. Is there anything that we can do to protect them or at the very least, maybe just do a better job of just making them aware of the risk? Because I think that practitioners like me, tax practitioners, financial advisors, those types of folks we're really struggling with uh, how do you tell people about this? I mean, uh, we're the experts in the industry and we're struggling with it. And so I, I think we struggle to sort of tell somebody who is not. A lot of times our clients are not financial, you know, financial uh, uh, experts. They don't may not just have a, a lot of, uh, you know, experience or just, uh, you know, expertise in the area. How do we talk to them about this and how do we make them aware of the risks? You know, that's a good that's a good question, Dave. And, and, and that certainly comes up a, a, a lot. What, what's been useful from from my perspective in kind of facilitating a discussion is that Regulators have gotten into this issue as a consumer 
um, um, information, consumer protection. Uh, and so the SEC has put out a number of guidance bulletins about investing in crypto, what you okay. should know before you invest in crypto. Similarly, um, you, you know, the Consumer Financial Protection Board uh, Bureau, whose primary mission in life is to protect consumers of financial products, services, and investments, has put out guidance to, to, to kind of basically put in front of potential uh, consumers of crypto financial products and services and investments, things you should be knowing and thinking about. And, you know, they all have a similar conclusion. And, and the CFTC, by the way, with respect to, uh, you know, as I said, you know, some cryptos uh, coins are, come on, are defined as commodities. I mean, there's, right. there's Bitcoin futures are trading uh, all over the place on the, on the commodities exchanges. Um, it, it all boils down to a couple of the same piece. And, and those are good. By the way, I think the SEC and the CFTC and the CFPB guidance written in relatively plain English, it's geared toward retail consumers worth putting in front of your clients, that, yeah. I, I believe. But and they all come back to some very similar in pieces of investment advice. Uh, you know, don't invest thing, money you're not willing to lose. These sure. are to some extent. Sure. Not you, you. You shouldn't be investing that. The you know you, you shouldn't be investing the farm here. You know this is not where you want to be. Yeah. Um, se second, understand how this product. I mean, is it being presented to you by a regulated crypto exchange? Who who regulates this crypto exchange? Uh, what kind of disclosure are you getting? Can you get access to about? this particular type of crypto. And that could be important because for sure the question may be, um, hey, you're investing actually in a company that's issuing crypto. They're going to take in the capital and they're going to start a business. You, you kind of need to know what kind of business, what their business plan looks like. What are they proposing to do? Does it make any sense? Those kind of things. And so really in, in, a, in, in a sense, Dave, in, um, Retail investors in crypto, th there's uh, the, the, the ground's been walked on here with respect to a lot of different types of financial investments. And the basic advice package still remains kind of the same, in my opinion. Yeah. When you look at what the agencies are putting out, and they have, you know, they have a frame of reference uh, experience with other types of financial services and products. So I, I think that's, uh, that's important. And, and just understanding which I think there's a way better understanding today than yeah. there might have been in March that, right. oh, yeah, this market doesn't go up forever. Right. It it's, it's got ups and downs. Now I got to know, I know about that now. You know, when I think about investing, don't assume it's going to keep going up forever like Bitcoin did, where people were just reveling at one point in the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the profitability, the, the increase in value and how, this was the most amazing investment. I can't get anything like this out of a 401k plan. Right. Kind of look at the world. And, you know, and that uh, that kind of tilted the discussion. Uh, as I said, any other marketplace, you have this kind of like frothy, what they call a frothy period. Yeah. Where things seem to be going up forever. And, um, it, it, you know, <laughs> it's another good revisit of what, what goes up doesn't necessarily go up, doesn't go up forever. You know, there, there's going to be a leveling a point that can go down and will go down. All depends on marketplace and individual company uh, events. I think that, uh, you know, and I think what you said there, I think uh, I, I hope that our listeners look at that as, as a bit of a comfort uh, from the standpoint that uh, you don't necessarily have to be an expert in digital assets to be helpful to clients who are thinking about investing in these things and, and, and are doing things with digital assets uh, because, you know, a lot of this sort of tried and true principles, they still hold. I mean, I think that's what I hear you saying, Jerry, is, is that a lot of those things kind of still hold. Uh, don't invest in things that you don't know about. Be careful that, you know, putting money into the markets is always a risk. I mean, I, I you know, and um, I, I think that that is, uh, you know, probably helpful to a lot of folks, uh, at least just getting over the 
um, I don't know, intimidation, I guess, for lack of a better word, the intimidation that comes with talking about uh, financial products that, uh, you know, you may not uh, necessarily feel personally very comfortable with, but your clients are asking about it. So you got to say something uh, because they're looking to you <laughs> for for some sort yeah. of a guidance or direction. Yeah, yeah. Look, it, it's no different uh, on some levels. When I've had this discussion for, you know, for for retail investors, I mean, it's no different than you're walking down the street and some guy says, "Hey, I have a really good Seiko watch I want to sell you." <laughs> but, you know, yeah. it, and it's only X number of dollars. Well, I, you know, do you really know enough to make that investment? Do you really right. know that this is a Seiko watch? Do you really know what a Seiko watch is worth? I mean, uh, is this? Particular person, the I mean, not to, not to besmirch the crypto trading industry, but it, it stands for the basic print. I mean, do you know is this person credible who's trying to sell you this? I mean, yeah, you know, in, in the crypto trading exchange context, the same as there is in the securities trading context, sure. uh, buying and selling securities, there are very similar principles. I mean, you've heard, you've heard, obviously heard the principle um, invest. You know, it's sometimes it's a good idea to invest in what you know. Yeah. Um, the converse is true too. Maybe yeah. it's not a good idea to invest in. You know, believe me, there is no. Uh, you know, there's no shame in saying, "Hey, I don't understand enough about um, Ethermax to yeah. invest in it." That's a smart move. Right. Don't, don't buy the Seiko watch if you don't know enough about the situation to say, "Okay, I think I understand what I'm getting myself into." I, I think that that's a, that's a great comment. I I also think, you know, before you and I hit record, one of the things that uh, we were talking about was we were talking about celebrity endorsements uh, and, and especially when it came to celebrity endorsements of digital assets. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, that probably influences people maybe more than they even realize, uh, you know, in terms of getting into, you know, you talked about, uh, you know, the seller, the seller of the Seiko watch. I mean, well, yeah, in this case, you know, the the seller of uh, the product sometimes is somebody that we admire, somebody we look up to, somebody that we see in movies and TV and everything else. Um, do you think that that influences the, the decision? I, I would imagine that it, that it would have to, at least to a degree. Yes, and and it's it, you know it's 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 a good point, Dave. The, the phenomena of celebrity crypto endorsements has has turned into a big problem for the celebrities, among others, as right. well as their fans and the public. Started out in the beginning with, with some some celebrity endorsements, but it's turned out to be a question of the industry. The crypto trading industry has the money to seek celebrity endorsements. These are yeah. obviously contract engagements for celebrities and by celebrities we're talking at a pretty wide variety of actors actresses athletes um and 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 a term that i'm still trying to get my hands around today a media influencer right uh, and, yeah and, you know where uh they have um their own social media sites uh kim kardashian for example has 330 million followers and what ended up happening was once you had the spate of uh, crypto exchange failures and the crashing of a number of these currencies, their fans who relied on these celebrity endorsements lost a lot of money. Yeah. And once you've had these exchange failures, guess what? You don't have the exchanges to sue because, as they say in the legal trade, they're not a deep pocket anymore because they probably don't have any assets that are going to be available Yep. So you look around from deep pockets and it's like, hey, uh, Tom Brady and Giselle Bündchen. Yeah. Uh, that, you know, Larry David. Yeah. Her enthusiasm. I mean, they're being sued. Those three, uh, if you're a tennis fan, uh, Naomi Osaka, tennis star, they're being they've been dragged into an 11 billion dollar lawsuit for the failure yeah. of FTX. And they in particular are specifically being charged with um, pumping up FTX's stock and, and it's uh, the coin involved and, and causing the investment to crash. You have similar things going on now. I mean, Kim Kardashian um, on another crypto that crashed this summer, Ethermax. Uh, she endorsed Ethermax on her Instagram, mm -hmm. posted 
to 330 million global followers. Hey, Ethermax is pretty cool investment. Well, SEC went after her because under the SEC so-called anti-touting rules, if you try to tout as security, yeah. uh, you have to disclose that you're getting a paid, you're paid to do that and how much you're getting paid. Now, it's interesting, uh, she, Kim Kardashian, by all uh, public reports, is worth about $1.7 billion. She got $250,000 for the endorsement, but after Ethermax crashed, um, uh, other than being involved in another set of uh, class action lawsuits that involved boxers Floyd Merriweather, her, Justin Bieber, I think, um, and others, um, the SEC said, hey, you violated the anti tanning rules. They subjected her to a cease and desist order. Uh, she's prohibited from making any crypto endorsements for three years. And, and they fined her $1.2 million. Now, maybe the $1.2 million won't, won't take a chunk out of the $1.7 billion she's worth. But the, 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 the question of um, if you're a celebrity, the question of your reputation yeah, is kind of right. important. And, and this has also had, you know, Dave, it's interesting. This has also had blowback, not only in celebrity endorsements, but celebrity crypto investments. Mm -hmm. um, folks like Ashton Kutcher announcing that they're putting $90 million into a crypto venture. Other, um, other celebs um, basically uh, offering their, you know, folks like Matt Damon offering their own so-called digital tokens, non-fungible tokens, NFTs, also being dragged into a raft of lawsuits. And, and the crypto investor premise is that fans and the public are investing because the celeb they like is investing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They must know what they're doing. They're worth money. And, and so, I, you know, I, I think it's going to have ramifications as a consumer retail investors in this whole question of celebrity endorsements. And, it, you know, it's quite possible that celebrity endorsers are going to start having to address the fact that they're subjecting themselves to a lot of liability, potential yeah. liability, yeah. and they're subjecting their fans and, and the public to potential, in some cases, catastrophic financial losses. And the question is, what do they need to do to first – not only protect the fans and the public, but themselves right. and their reputations. What do they need to do? What's their due diligence before they take on, um, you know, an endorsement? What, what should they, I mean, you know, you might want to look at it. I mean, on some levels, I mean, it's just my opinion. I mean, you may want to look at it as if you were um, making an investment yourself. What do you need to know about this company and, and their crypto? Because it could you, it could subject you to liability and, and your fans might hate you. You wake up right. one morning. Yeah. Fans are pretty ticked off at you for this thing you proposed to them to invest in. So I think there's more on that uh, to come. But for, for retail investors, yeah, I mean, just because your favorite actor or a baseball player says something about this particular crypto, you know, once again, that that doesn't mean anything other than if you're interested because they make you interested, you got to go do your homework. Uh, yeah. And understand what yeah. you're investing in. Same rules, same rules apply. Even if Matt Damon is, is or, or Tom Brady, if you're if you're a Tampa Bay fan, uh, or, you know, you, you have to do your homework. Yeah. So so no substitute for doing your homework. Don't just take uh, take the word of your celebrity endorser uh, there on TV. Right. Uh, I think that uh, I think that those are good, uh, good pieces of advice. Well, um, so you mentioned that you have a book. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the book and uh, kind of what it's about and uh, and uh, just kind of uh, some of the pieces that and how how uh, could people, uh, our listeners, uh, if they're interested, how could they get a copy of that book? Well, Dave, thanks for asking me that question. Uh, <laughs> Well, it, you know, the book's called Virtual Currency, um, uh, the Emerging Legal Regulatory F Policy Framework, or Framework. Um, it's published by Aspen, Aspen Law, Walters, Walters W-L-T-E-R-S, Kluwer, K-L-U-W-E-R. You go to the Walters, Kluwer, Aspen Law website, put my name in, and this book will come up on the screen if you're interested. Um, and, and really what it's all about is it was intended um, to be a, um, as someone who advises clients, it was intended to be a book 
about all of the emerging areas of law and regulation that folks should, and policy that folks should be interested in and understand. And so, um, you know, start by looking, you know, and so it explores a number of these different areas, ranging from state and federal money transmission law, regulation and licensing requirements, uh, the federal securities laws, and there's a lot of federal securities laws. It's not only the stock offering rules, and when crypto and, and coins and tokens would be considered securities and should be subject to, to registration with the SEC uh, in a prospectus, but also the broker dealer rules. If you're selling crypto, that should be a security and you're not registered as a, uh, a an SEC registered broker dealer, uh, retail investors uh, should beware because it may be an illegal exchange. Um, the mutual fund laws, big issue recently has been, uh, can you offer any type of crypto in, in a fund? Uh, right, and right. how the FTC's handled that. Then you have the, uh, the commodities laws and how um, different types of Bitcoin options and futures have been considered derivatives and commodities under the commodities laws. Uh, and, and uh, you know, need to need to be registered on commodities exchanges to trade. And you got the same issues as the SEC. You know, if you're commodities, uh, if you're not a commodities dealer registered with the CFTC, you shouldn't be trading commodities as, right. as a business yeah. matter. Um, you have the commercial laws. This has been a big issue in all 50 states. Uh, can you perfect the security interest in crypto to take out a loan? That, that has become an issue, and a number of states have started to change their laws to actually facilitate that. Uh, Texas, Wyoming, uh, Oklahoma, and a few other states. Uh, and how do you address bank and non-bank lending with crypto as collateral? Uh, there's certainly the tax laws. I mean, that has yeah. been a humongous area of controversy as the IRS has uh, concluded that crypto, for their purposes— they don't care what any other federal agency says <laughs> uh, or state agency, for that matter. But as far as they're concerned, crypto is not um, a type of money. It's a piece of property. That's right. And so when you tax, when you when the federal tax code kicks in on property, totally different scenario than when it kicks in on trading currencies. And uh, this has caused a lot of issues. Uh, the IRS has got involved in trying to track down crypto uh, owners that buy and sell their crypto and when the tax laws are implicated, they've gone after the big exchanges like Coinbase and demanded they turn over an entire customer lists uh, to try to contact it. And starting next year, uh, you, you know, the, the exchange, the, the trading exchanges will start to report um, customer uh, trading activity for purposes of uh, uh, the, you, you know, the federal tax laws, the, the IRS has put out tons of Q's and A's on these issues of when. Yep. But, you know, the, the, the most blatant example of concern has been the, the cup of coffee for Bitcoin hypothetical. You know, if you go into a Starbucks or your favorite coffee place and you even use a tiny little bit of a Bitcoin that you own and, you, you know, the Bitcoin can be chopped up into little pieces it may trigger, you know, buying a four dollar, four or five dollar cup of coffee because that's what it costs these days. You know, buying a cup of coffee at Starbucks may trigger tax gain on the entire Bitcoin you own that you use this little piece to do. So a lot of interesting issues. And I know a lot of accountants, for example, and, and local lawyers have been kind of buried in questions about how crypto trades are to be and, and crypto use is to, to be accounted for. You got the banking laws and it's everything from um the, the federal banking regulators have taken the position any bank that wants to conduct any type of crypto activity now has to apply to yeah. the banking regulator and receive a no objection uh, letter. So the regulators, that's half the regulators want to know what the heck's going on in, yep. with banks and crypto. And second, they want to see what it is so they can react to it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And they're, you know, in the process, they're trying to learn as much as they can in order to, uh, in order to deal with when there are, are legitimate opportunities in areas where they they might uh, be concerned as well. And you also have the whole question of uh, licensing and charting so-called fintech charters, which both the OCC 
and the New York Department of Financial Services ha has offered, just to name a few. You've got the consumer protection angle. We've got all these agencies weighing in on consumer protection. So the book is basically designed to, to give you a good panorama of what regulation is looking like, where the government is and is heading, the enforcement cases they've brought, the guidance they've put out, uh, the issues uh, that they that they uh, raise. Um, and so, uh, you know, as one of the first books, but, but, you know, my publisher says it's the first book um, out on the emerging legal and regulatory framework. Hope, hope to uh, hope provides good information and analytical base as a reference book for folks who need to understand uh, various areas. Well, so folks, uh, if you're listening to this and you want to get a better grasp on uh, the regulatory uh, landscape, check out Jerry's book. Okay, so I mean, this is uh, uh, this is a good a good place to start. And you know, as uh, he just mentioned, I mean, it's uh, it's one of a kind. Uh, so at least uh, you know we just don't have a lot of information out there. So uh, so that is certainly a, a good place to start. Um, if folks would like to get a hold of you, Jerry, uh, is there a good way for them to do that? Yes. Uh... Comizio at wcl.american.edu. I could put that on the chat screen if you want. Uh, that uh, yep, and we will also uh, drop that uh, in uh, the uh, notes to uh, this particular podcast, so the folks uh, can get a hold of you uh, if they would like to know more about uh, anything that we talked about today. So, Jerry, thank you so much. Uh, this is such this is fascinating. Uh, this is fascinating stuff. Uh, the uh, you know the the landscape right now is just uh, is just amazing, and uh, and I appreciate uh, just your willingness to get on and just uh, talk about uh, something that I feel like, uh, I mean, a lot of us practitioners, I think we're really struggling with, and I, and I th think we just feel like we don't, we don't have a good handle on it. And I'm hopeful that today, maybe after, after this conversation, they listen to this podcast and maybe they feel a little bit better about it. Well, yeah. And Hey, stay tuned. I mean, next time we talk, uh, you, you, you know, there may be a whole new federal comprehensive set of regulation of crypto and trading exchanges. That's true. And the more interesting scenario is, or not, or it's, not. It's going to be hard. To, it's going to be hard to say what happened. I mean, I I thought it was interesting how um, the hearings they've held recently on FTX, the House Financial Services Committee, in their hearings, but possibly in an effort to attract some attention, one of the panelists they had speaking was uh, Kevin O'Leary, Mister Wonderful from Shark Tank, uh, who who's who's not a, who, who is not a particular fan of crypto. But, you know, he's a name in a lot, you know, there, there's a there's a there's a media influencer and a celebrity there right there. <laughs> and, you know, they, they managed to uh, to get him into the hearings to, to continue to, to, to hopefully shine some light on the issue. Well, that's great. Well, I, you know, Jerry, you're right. I mean, uh, we all need to stay tuned uh, for this particular topic. Uh, again, it's uh, I think uh, we're just kind of getting started uh, with uh, digital assets and uh, virtual currency, and uh, we're all interested to see where the future is going. So uh, thank you so much for being on Accountable. Uh, again, uh, Jerry Camizio, uh, so just uh, talking through all of these uh, things uh, related to virtual currency and digital assets. Thank you, Jerry, for uh, being on Accountable. Dave, thanks. Uh, great to be here. And and uh, next time I, I will bring a couple of lawyers jokes with me. There you go. There you go, folks. All right. Thank you so much. T take care.